cassette number 11 from The Waiting on God, held in Indianapolis, Indiana, December 27 to 29, 1985. We continue and conclude the Saturday morning session, December 28th. Oh, we're having a good time? We're having a good time. Just think, Jesus loves me, this I know. And God is singing to this little boy, to us, this song, Jesus loves me, loves him, loves me, loves all of us alike. Isn't that precious? It is, it is, it's great. Yes, play again, please. Thank you. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Oh, you're getting it. Thank you. Yes, Gordon. Amen. Yes, please do, Gordon. It was so precious, the uh, dedication of you and Rebecca. Yes. Uh, this precious uh, orphan boy, and he's not over, he belongs to all of us. Yes. We're grateful, of course, for the gifts that uh, God has put within Tim. Yes. He's been graduated now a little over a year, a year ago last June, and, and working. God's blessed him and helped him in his sales work. Yes. And one of the things that uh, has stirred my heart and blessed me that uh, he wanted to remodel his mother's kitchen for a Christmas present. Oh, that is uh, me. He's gone out on a limb, borrowed quite a bit of money that to uh, to do that, and we're extremely grateful and in debt to him uh, because he has this vision of wanting to do for his mother what I've not been able to do for her, but. We're thankful for what God's doing through him. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, that's so sweet. Precious brother. Hallelujah. Amen. I believe I'll get a thousand dollars and give it to you. On the kitchen. Praise the Lord. Isn't that great? Not, not from the Lord's treasury. Not from the Lord's treasury, but from what he's given me through brothers and sisters. How much did it cost? It'd probably be about 4500 4500 Well, I'll give you 3000 That'll be the big part. That'll be the big part. You went out on a limb, so the Lord will help us to get you off of it. <laughs> you did this for mother, so the Lord will do this for you. I save you. Amen. Give and it should be given you. So you gave. <laughs> you want this mother to have a new kitchen. Gordon loved to have got it, but you see, all ministers' salaries are limited. And so Jesus to take what we have, give to him so his mother could have a kitchen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Isn't that great? Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. Oh, well, we've had a great time. We didn't know it was going to be such a time in an offering, did we? <laughs> oh, that touches my heart, Gene. <laughs> Oh, I know what he always gives. If you are given to God, if all your tithes and offerings aren't in the storehouse, and you're not a servant to the man of God, I tell you, you're missing out on something. You're missing it. You're missing the most exciting walk there is. I think God's never failed me yet. I tell you, whenever I've given, God has blessed. Always. He has given it back. See, he's trying to teach that young man to give. Yes. For he has to go through some hardships and things. Yes. See, he's trying to teach him right now to give. Yes. See, we go through a lot of hard lessons because we don't want to give. True. Then God has to take his way down to, and take it away from us to teach us how to give. Oh. But I'm so thankful. 
See, I'm rejoicing. There's such a blessing in giving. There is. Oh, God's done so much for me, much. for giving. Oh, he's, oh, he's blessed me over and over and over. If I had time to tell you the stories, Hallelujah. what God has oh, done for me. I mean, just brought it and laid it right in my lap. It's amazing. Praise God. <laughs> See, because I say, God, how much you want of this? How much you want of that? I pray about this. See, don't be selfish with your money. When you give it away, it just multiplies it. God brings it back. He will not fail us. He will not fail us. And I was thinking this morning that when you said the church needed to repent, when God talked to the children of Israel in Malachi, he said, you repent. And they said, wherewith shall we repent? He said, you have robbed me. Tithes and offerings. Yes, sir. He said, and they said, we're in it. We robbed you, God. He said, in tithes and offerings. Yes. Church, our tithes and our offerings must be in. Yes. Because God withheld from them, yes. even from the land. Yes. He withheld from them. And I tell you, I know it to be a fact in my own life. When I put the men of God first, and I put God first on my list, God has blessed and blessed and blessed. Yes. He's blessed in yes. health. He's blessed in material. He's blessed in my children. I tell you, he's given me so many blessings, Brother Hal. Hallelujah. They're We're just too to numerous to mention. It is so great and so wonderful. Yes. So this thrills me to see a young man start to get a hold of this, <laughs> to help the man of God right now. <laughs> see, yes. to help his father and mother. Yes. 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 See, oh, if we could get a hold of it, what God would do for us. Yes. See, there wouldn't be any need yes. any place yes. if we could really get a hold of this. That's right. And really be a servant to the men of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, that's wonderful. Well, we're ready for the, uh, I was going to say we're ready for the announcements. And the Lord said, not yet. Isn't that something? Praise God. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> See how important this offertory was? We had to wait for an hour nearly to find him. Found him by the Holy Spirit clear in the back of the room. All I could see was the arm. I had to look around to see his face. Amen. Little did he know, I know when we started offering it, Rebecca's kitchen was coming through. His son was believing God. Isn't it great? Oh, it's wonderful. What do you think about it? <laughs> Exciting. <laughs> oh, glory be to the Father, Son of the Holy Ghost. I need thee every hour. Every second, Lord God of hosts. Oh, 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 oh hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my, they love one another. Oh, it's so precious. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Amen. <laughs> oh, Jesus helps us the next session like this. It's going to be wonderful. Keep saying, oh, Jesus, I don't know how to come in or to go out from thee, my wonderful love and grace. Hallelujah. Uh, I was going to say, we'll have the now. He said, wait a minute. Well, we had a great time since then. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Oh, it's so wonderful. Hallelujah. Amen. <clears throat> oh, it's so precious to be in divine order. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Uh, Brother John McAdams, our secretary here, the announcements. <clears throat> remember about the songbooks, and remember about a few other things. <clears throat> oh, say, uh, Timothy, come up here and let me love you. Praise the Lord. Amen. Yes, come up here so I can love you. When I first saw you, you were just a little boy. And you remember how that when you were in Asbury, how that the Lord would have you go over to take care of Mrs. Uh, McIntyre. Mrs. McIntyre. See, her husband, I heard him preach long years ago. And you, he, God would take him. He wasn't very old, was he, uh, Gordon, when he'd go over? 
he, God had laid it on his heart to go over and run errands for her. Dr. McIntyre's a widow. And to, to help her and run errands and look after her. It touched me deeply when you and Rebecca would tell me. He wasn't very, he was just a boy. Young fellow. Yes, not in the very old. A very old. And God had laid it on his heart. Not because you told him to do it. No. Or someone else told him, but he just uh, loved her and would run errands and want to go over and take care of her. Isn't it wonderful? I think it's great that Jesus would lay it on his heart because of her faith and her trust and your love to God to see that she was taken care of when you were small. You had a great time doing it, probably. I enjoyed it. You enjoyed it very much. It was a great blessing to her. We will not know in this life what it meant to her until we meet in the morning. That's when we'll find out a little bit about it. About how Jesus helped you to help this widow run the errands and take care of this and that for her. It's when you were younger. So glad to see you. Appreciate you. Well, I appreciate that, John. That's good news to me. That he was saying, how lovely are thy dwellings. Well, we'll pray for your throats so maybe you'll improve in the next few sessions so that you'll have that ability to bring out the tones and what you really want to get out of your heart. Praise the Lord. Lord. Amen. Jesus, he's had a cold, and his, uh, his larynx is uh, a little bit uh, filled with infection, sickness. And so I pray in the name of Jesus that you will lift this infection out of the voice chamber, out of the sinus chamber, out of all the areas of the head and the neck, that you will lift it out for the glory of God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, in Jesus' name so that he may uh, be uh, able to sing this beautiful number sometime later, How Lovely Are Thy Dwellings. Uh, My wife used to sing it for me 50 years ago, and it was so great. 45 years ago, and oh, God bless me, how it helped me. Thank you, Jesus, for healing. By faith in Christ Jesus, in the holy name I ask it. By his stripes, ye are healed. Appreciate you very much. Thank you for everything you've done for us. Not just yes, all of our folks and making these arrangements, all the trips that you've made here, all the wonderful contacts. You see, you have a wonderful personality with people, with men. You know how to help people, and you're a treasure. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God. Thank you, Jesus. After the years, you'd always say to me time and again, the best is ahead of us. To Jesus' glory. For his kingdom to come. Church to be revived. Come one as the Father and the Son are one. I'm supposed to love you again. (laughs) Takes a lot of my telephone calls and people call. He doesn't tell me any any of the heartaches. Tries to keep them from me. Trials of people, wonders, bewilderments, people want to know this, want to know this, how come of this. He doesn't get that. Too. So he takes a lot of, of things and does a lot of things, but God's grace doing it through him. I praise him for it. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're grateful for all our five men, each one of them. Praise We've the Lord. sure been the recipients of 
God's grace and mercy to us. We've just never been able to outgive God. Yes, it's been so wonderful how He has helped us, directed, blessed. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Making announcements is not a very uh, pleasant thing to do. I mean, when God's working and it's precious, it's not something that you choose to get up and do. But I wouldn't have missed that for anything. So I thank God for announcements. Thank you for going softly or quietly through the halls and and uh, being uh, careful. Uh, Brother Paul Walker's brought my our breakfast yesterday morning and this morning. Yesterday about five, this morning about six. It's such a gracious help, you know. And since son Kenneth is not here, he's come right along to help us. And he uh, did as I had requested. I said, please tell the cooks that prepare our meal of our gratitude and our thanksgiving. And, and they told him that... Uh, a very wonderful word. I can't repeat it, but it was very encouraging about all of you, about your being gracious and nice and helpful and uh, thankful. And I, I wanted to tell you that your love and your thoughtfulness is helping, encouraging the people that work here. The songbooks will be taken up real gently and placed on the chairs when we leave, I trust that we will have everything taken care of. I want to thank you all for helping us to take care of the room and leaving it clean so that if someone walks in, they'll say, were there so many people here? Yes. And we've endeavored to teach us these things now for many years, and you have been uh, <laughs> wonderful to cooperate and to be thoughtful. So thank you for that. Now let us stand for a prayer, please. Two o'clock this afternoon, we'll convene. Uh, I, if I'm able, I'll be here a little ahead of that time. And my wife, if she's able. I'm so grateful that she's able to be with me. Yeah. After these uh, 52, going in 53 years together. And we praise the Lord for that. So grateful for our children, our grandchildren. And our brothers and sisters, sons and daughters and mothers that are here from over this country. <coughs> Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank thee, Father, for Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and how thee has led in these services. How you have helped us this morning when we came in, we felt so utterly needy and limited not knowing just how to come in to the service or to go out, except you would grant us an understanding heart because moment by moment and time by time we were trusting for thy guidance to know exactly what thy will is. And it's by thy mercies I would know again. So I want to give thee praise for it. I want to thank thee for this is a very wonderful gift to all of us to have thy direction instead of our own instigating and trying to figure this out. We pray in Jesus' name, our Heavenly Father, for the great salvation of Jesus, the precious blood, as we walk in the light with Thee, and have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. We thank Thee and honor Thee and praise Thee for all Thee is doing here in our hearts uh, to uh, bring us to repentance and cleansing and inner crucifixion and in her death to the place where he brings us into nothingness, where we willing to become nothing that he may become all things, and there we find life and we find all things uh, that uh, satisfies. So we praise thee for it, O oh God, for each soul victory here this morning. Thankful for the sister that has come home. She meant by that home to the fellowship of Jesus, the fellowship of the Holy Ghost, where God is and where Jesus is and his people love one another as Jesus loves us and that we will hear your voice and follow. We thank thee, Father, in Jesus' holy name. I'm going to ask Lloyd Townsend uh, to have prayer now and uh,
also uh, Roger Yoder, these two precious ones. Would you like to come up? After prayer, if you'll be seated for a moment until the ushers will show you out. Also, may I quickly mention that uh, we understand that there were some children that were taken over to the area where uh, where parents and can take care of the children and watch uh, on closed circuit TV. Some children were left unattended yesterday evening, so we'd ask you not to do that. Uh, you just we we'll just have to stay with them if you would. Thank oh, you. Yes, please. Yes, all the children cannot be left by themselves because there's, there's situations that happen to the best of children. So we appreciate you looking after them. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll bow our heads, please. Heavenly Jesus, we thank thee today for your love. We thank Thee for these men of God. We thank Thee for the words that You bring to us through them. We thank You for Your divine guidance, for the visions, and for the revelations. It's all food for us. We thank this in Your holy name. But most importantly, Jesus, we thank You for Your love. Without Your love, we would all be lost. That's what brings us together. It's what will hold us together. It's what will carry us through. Without the love, we would all be lost. And we feed on it. We feast on it. We can't get enough of it. And Jesus, just keep pouring it on me because I need it so much. Help us go from this place today to share this love with everybody we see, with everybody we touch. Let it permeate throughout the building throughout this city, and throughout the world. Let them in on what we have and what we want more of. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we're thankful for your love to us today. We're thankful for your great mercy. And we're thankful for the way you love us through obedience. Because we can see that as you give the guidance of the Holy Spirit to the man of God, you are loving us, each one individually. True fact. And I'm thankful for your great love. Thank you. Thank you for all your provisions. We're thankful for this food. We pray, Jesus, that you would sanctify it in Jesus' name to our body's use and us to your kingdom. Help us to go from this place today better people than when we came. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Be with Brother and Sister Helm. Strengthen, revitalize them, quicken them, undergird them. Jesus, we pray. Oh, God, send the ministering angels to them and minister to them today. Revive them and quicken them in Jesus' holy name. We're trusting you to do it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Beginning the Saturday afternoon session, December 28th. from 
the fears of the past For I've traded my shackles For a glorious song I'm free, praise the Lord Free at last I'm free from the guilt that I carry From that dull, empty life I'm set free For when I met Jesus He made me complete He forgot the foolish one I used to be I'm free from the fears of tomorrow And I'm free from the guilt of the past For I've traded my shackles For a glorious song I'm free long enough. Just two stanzas. Well, the next two. as fun and pleasure when we view them 
from heaven's portals, they'll seem dull and very poor. Oh, I want my goods to all be stored in God's great kingdom. I want my friends to be a part of his own crowd. I want my life to count in terms of heaven's values. I want his will in my heart to abound. He will not ask who we are. He will not care where we've been. He will not see all the goods of earth we've owned. He will not turn to whom we knew, nor will he feel our fame that grew. If we found and done his will. Matthew Amen. 7, 21. Amen. Not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, preaches or prays or works. Not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. That's to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, and love our neighbor as ourselves. That's God's will. See, it's God's will uh, to wait upon him and listen for his guidance. It's God's will that we pray without ceasing. It's God's will that we meditate on his word, our love is true. It's God's will that we follow Jesus. It's God's will that we deny ourselves, no longer do what we want, what we like, what we desire, what seems feasible, what seems reasonable, what seems good. No, just deny ourselves and let the Holy Spirit bring us as the cross is resumed and we there die to ourself and then he begins to teach us when we take the cross how to follow Jesus. We do not know how to follow Jesus, except self is denied and the carnal nature is crucified. We cannot hear what following is. So that is why it's so necessary that the old nature in us that's so selfish and prideful and jealous and as enmity and strive. You see, anyone is carnal, you can't please them. Someone the other day told me, one of my dear friends gets, ex gets a little disappointed with us, or with somebody. Well, anyone that's carnal, you can't please them. I mean, it's how, how you try. I couldn't please a carnal man if I tried. No, I'd let him down somewhere. And, but now, anyone that's spiritual, that's, that's, Sufficiently sanctified, they don't require anything of anybody. But anyone is carnal, you can't hardly please them. Oh, they want it this way, it's got to be, and if he does this and he doesn't do that, and this is the way I want, I think it ought to be this way. See, carnality must be cleansed out of us before we know anything about what following is. We don't know what God's will is unless by the Holy Spirit. Well, we know the Bible tells us that we're not to steal and commit adultery and put away our companion and marry another. The Bible's very clear about that. The Bible's very clear that I'm not to take anything that doesn't belong to me. The Bible's very clear that I'm not to talk about anyone. It's God's will that we never murmur or find fault. The Bible's very clear about God's will on many, many issues. 
But there are many things that we do not, that's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. Lauren Helm goes out to Indianapolis on December the 27th and wait before Jehovah, the King of glory, Jesus. And have the dear ones that follow me with you to wait before him. This isn't in the Bible. But the Holy Spirit revealed by the witness of the Holy Ghost that we were to be here. So by his grace, we're here. See, the Bible makes many things clear. It's, it's the word of God. And it tells us how deceitful the heart is. And it also tells through Jesus that only a few people will find the kingdom of heaven. Few be that find it. See, that's, that's the word. Now, everyone may find it if they will, if they have the right spirit. Create within me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. That's God's will. Isn't that wonderful? That's God's will. It's very clear. And it's very clear in God's word that those that follow him have one, uh, especially, one characteristic is that they're praising the Lord some of the time or part of the time or a good bit of the time. <laughs> It says we're to rejoice evermore. Rejoice always. And again, I say to thee, rejoice. Now, that's God's will. It's to rejoice and to pray. I believe it's God's will to have family prayer. I believe if, if a husband and wife are Christian, one of the first things they want to do is to say, now we're going to have prayer. It's either in the morning or in the evening. We're going to have it together. We're going to wait before the Lord. To try to have a Christian home without family prayer would be like trying to have a factory without machinery. To try to have a Christian home without family prayer, you see, is it's just very difficult. You say, well, it's hard. We've got different schedules. Oh, I know we do. But when they come together five or 10 or 15 minutes, have family prayer then. I believe it's God's will for us to pray together, husband and wife. Once in a while? No, daily. And so by God's grace, uh, my wife and I have been together now. I've not been with any other woman by God's grace for 53 years, next April the 14th. And since then, we've prayed together. And we are pressed to have family prayer when our, before our daughters were born. And since, it wasn't easy when they were around 10 or about 12 to 15. No, oh, they didn't uh, especially want to have family prayer then. Some children, some children, they, uh, they get a little spirit of some kind and they'd rather not have family prayer. And some children are delighted. So we just take the ones that delight and help them along. The ones that don't want to, we just uh, pray for wisdom and know how to love them. As I said to my wife between 45 and 50 years ago, I said, now, honey, this, see, I was only in my 20s, late 20s, early 30s. I said, honey, if we will, by God's grace, read his word, pray and obey and do the Lord's will and love Jesus and love everyone and be obedient uh, to the Holy Spirit's guidance, and just love our children and not, not coerce them or abuse them, but chasten them properly in a Christian manner, a Christian way. I said, if we're faithful when they're little, I believe Jesus will bring them in when they're older. You remember that day? Yeah, I do too. And she said, she agreed with me. So it was up to me to share that. And she believed it. She knew it was true. And so the Lord was faithful. So here we have James, Jack, and John, and Martha, and Nancy, and Joyce, and our grandchildren, and our great-grandchildren. And the Lord did, has done all of it. He's brought all of our dear ones out to Jesus that hey, this could be through the Holy Spirit. But it's God's will for us to have family prayer and secret prayer, waiting before the Lord, and doing God's will. And to, to wait until someone says, I can't discern God's will. 
Well, just wait upon the Lord. Uh, you know to pray and to read the word and to witness. It's God's will that we witness. Not to overdo it or underdo it, but be on time. Say only what the Lord wants us to say without antagonizing or without upsetting people. See, some people will just try to, you know, they're overzealous and they don't mean to, but we need to have wisdom of what to say and what not to say. Now, there's much more not to say than there is to say. There's only a little to say. Most things are better not said. There's oceans not to say. There's a thimbleful to speak. We must know where the thimble is and how to get the drops in it. And that comes by prayer and dying and obeying and following. So the Holy Spirit knows all things. And Jesus knows what's in us, all of us. And he knows how to direct us uh, to uh, be taught how to speak the Hebrew language doesn't come in the first lesson. No, the second lesson, no, the 20th, no, the 100th lesson. To speak fluently Hebrew, I don't know how many lessons you'd have to take to understand perfectly all about the Hebrew language. But it's a constant study applying. And if we, from the time of conversion, will obey and witness at each opportunity and mind the check of the Holy Spirit, always learn the check of the Holy Spirit. We need to know the sound a wool, stop. That's not a particular sound. It's a discerning of the spirit within. Uh, in conversion, we need to know when God wants us or desires for us to speak. Now you're in a meeting and your heart begins to throb. It means that he is letting you know that he's in that assembly. Or he is working with your heart relative to the kingdom of God. Now, if you are not converted or saved, you haven't wanted, that means you need to be saved. Now, if you have been saved and you prayed sufficiently and you've been faithful and there's the operation in your heart, it means that he wants you to be attentive to the revelation, whether it is for entire sanctification or whether it is about the burden of the person near you or far from you. There are many, many things uh, that we have to learn in prayer and in the walk with the Lord to discern what God's will is. We only know his will by the help of the Holy Spirit as we obey him from the very beginning. Now, if we miss a few lessons, we have to come back to the beginning and begin to be taught. Because we're in the beginning after a long while, seemingly. I've said that I perhaps am in the beginning because it's always ever existing. It's unending. So he teaches us little by little. I, I'm learning just gradually, little by little, to discern what the Holy Spirit would have us to do or go. Now, there's times after I walked with God 20 or 30 years, then he had his Holy Spirit teach me by his mercies and by his gifts, uh, to stop, just wait here for a while. Because he wants us to wait, and uh, times now I'll be going through a room. But of course it didn't happen overnight, it took years and years of following, and, and he will speak to me and tell me, or share with me certain things that are going on in the earth, or under the earth, or above the earth, or in the ministry, or in governments, or chaos, or upheaval, or secret sin, or what all he may be telling me. I just trust in Jesus and doing his will, giving him all the glory and all the praise, our being nothing, he being all things. So it is God's will. That we are taught within by the Holy Spirit. They shall all be taught of God. We're taught by the Holy Spirit within us. As our heart is ever looking upward, as we praise Him sufficiently, 
And as we give him all the glory and the honor, and as we love all the peoples everywhere. For you see, if I have the slightest resentment, then that hinders me from ever knowing God's will. See, I would never, I wouldn't be likely to ever know God's will if I had the slightest resentment about anybody or anything. Therefore, we must have a heart cleansed by the holy blood of Jesus that there are no resentments or jealousies or envies or earthly loves because if I have an earthly love, it's so great there, I can't quite discern the message of the kingdom. I guess we're in a schoolroom now being taught of how to discern God's will. It's very easy for us to think that it's time. Just like yesterday, I thought it was time to pray. I, was going, I wanted Thomas to pray. Oh, what a pray, pray. But he didn't pray then. You see, I called for him to come up to pray. And just as I did, the Holy Spirit and the gifts said, wait just a moment. And then we had, he told me that, Remember when I revealed to you about 10 or 20 minutes ago what was to be, and we did it. Oh, we were blessed. And then it was time for the prayer. You see, just to have a service and we sing and we pray, there's a time for a song, there's a time for prayer, there's time for revelation, there's time for preaching. And I would meditate about this 47, 8 years ago. I said, Jesus, Heavenly Father, we just get together in our meetings and we sing a song, a good song. We sing another one and then we think, well, it would be good to have prayer. So we have prayer. And then we sing another song and it's good to have some announcements, we think. And then we have another song. We'll have a spatial and the offertory and the spatial and then preach. I said, now, Lord, I don't know how to discern. So I'll just do the best I can till you teach me. And that's what we all do. So we don't press to know, we simply follow and submit to God's Holy Spirit. But to be taught of God is a high privilege. I know I'm the least one in the class somewhere, maybe up a little ways. I don't know how far from the bottom I am. But you know, wherever we are, if we're happy there, we might get a promotion but we're never to find it out. We're never to find it out. Because if we think ourselves to be a little something, then we subtracted everything. It's all minus. Suddenly. The one we're just happy to be at the bottom of the class and just rejoice and trust and let him lead us. Not think of ourselves anything, but just a servant. Then he could teach us what an alpha is like, what a beta is like. Little by little, he teaches us, everyone that will follow. And it's, it's not like earthly classes at all. It's altogether different. It's in the Holy Spirit. It's in the kingdom of God. It's walking. It's listening. It's rejoicing. It's moving as God leads us. So he knew when Thomas was to pray, and he prayed such a prayer. Oh, when the procession was wonderful this morning. Oh, it was so dear, so precious. You see, when Thomas got through uh, praying, he was damp. He was perspiring. His body was just like it worked. Shoeing a horse. Maui, hey, yeah, right here. Oh, he was in this thing. Of course, we were too. But you see, prayer was so great, but you see, the human in me wanted prayer at one time. And he said, wait just a moment, I have something else. Now you see, only the Lord, I don't know anything, as you heard me say, and that's right. So he wants, he desires us to follow him. It's God's will to follow Jesus. And to rejoice, not to be ever discouraged. Carnal nature will try to get you discouraged. The spiritual nature will always keep you up. The carnal nature always looked at the dark side. The spiritual nature looked at the beautiful side. Amen. It's the darkest night. Spiritual nature of us, uh, the holiness of God, the purity of Jesus, the faith. Oh, that touched my heart on the purity of Jesus. It operates right there with me now. Now, you see, I walked with God a long, long time before I, before I would be taught of his righteousness, his peace, his joy, the Holy Ghost, revelation, direction, and all the, the wonderful things he was doing. 
And then I learned after maybe 30 or 40 years, when I get to praying, uh, I'd get in a room by myself. Oh, what a time I could have, you know, all by myself, just praying. And Jesus would help me uh, to pray. And when I pray, it seems like I have to just get into it with all my heart about it. I can whisper, all right, he hears me. But if my voice will let me, I just love to get a hold of the throne. And when God would let me in a place all by myself, a little closet or a little bathroom, so I wouldn't, you know, be uh, too loud with other people. Why, if I could pray uh, and just say three or four or five minutes or six or whatever it was, God would sometimes just come right down on me. Oh, the glory, and I just become so happy. And of course, then I want everybody in there with me. <laughs> it took a while to break through the darkness. But what I did, I said, oh, I wish everybody's in on this. It's like the Lord working here when God is working this morning and yesterday. It is such a, well, we can't explain how sweet it is, how wonderful it is, how glorious it is. So it's God's will that we do not doubt. It's God's will that we resist unbelief. It's God's will that we keep our mind upon his will, his truth, his word, his purpose. This is God's will. It's God's will that I never look back because he that put his hand to the plow and looks back, oh, what he said was a tremendous thing. You know, when I used to have the horse and the little plow and you'd start across, and if you thought I'd like to investigate and see how straight the fire was, every time you stop and look back, when you get clear through, you can see every place you stop, and you, you waver just a little bit. When you start, you can't stop. You must go constantly onward in prayer and faith and belief and never stop to think, well, how, how well am I getting along? We're keeping our eyes upon Jesus. We're staying our mind upon him so that he can make the furrow as he sees. If he wants a little bend in it, it'll be all right. It'll grow as much as the straight ones, if it's his will, if we're all right. And give him all the praise. But we're just to follow. To follow. To follow. Follow me. Jesus said, follow me. That kind of has kind of broken my heart at times because I can hear what he said. He said, follow me and I don't know whether they had very many following. But that's not for me to figure out. It's for me to be faithful and follow. It's only a handful or a thousand or a million or a billion. Keep following. Never try to find out where we are. Just go ahead. Go on. Some people want to find out if they're, how far they've come along spiritually. But while they try to find out while they're coming along spiritually, they cease the path. They cease following. There's a tendency, there's a human weakness in wanting to know, you know, you accept a kernel of corn, fall to the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it died, it brings forth much fruit. So uh, when we are planted in the soil of his purpose, that's when we take the cross and we're inwardly crucified and we're submerged beneath the soil of his word, his purpose, his truth, and all of his love and so on. We're submerged there and he plants us in the soil. And it's quite a rough thing sometimes to get us off the cob of self and get the kernel down in the soil. And sometimes when we're planted in the soil for a while, we kind of want to uncover the soil and see if we've sprouted anything. And then we just spoil the whole crop. Uh, we, we don't want to do that. There's a tendency to do that. But he wants, he desires us to follow and be obedient to him, following his will. See, when Jaya said to my wife, would your husband come to India? She said, I, I do not know whether the Lord will lead him to India. She said, we need the message in India that God has given him. And that is to not do our own will, but do God's will. To deny ourselves, take up the cross, be really crucified, yield to him, obey, listen to the voice of Jesus and follow, and let him work through us. 
we need this message. I know I was coming back from one of the journeys and there was a, a charismatic group that said to me, have you ever been led to a certain group? And I said, no, I haven't. And they said, we wish you'd come over to our group and teach us about love, about how to love everybody, love the whole group, everyone. And I said, well, that's the very essence of uh, Christianity is to love as he loves. Now, when the Lord led us to go to India, he spoke to me and told me when to go. And did you know he told me to go to India when Jaya would never have had me to go? She said, Daddy, I would never have had you to go on the 22nd day of September. It's the time of the monsoon rains. Oh. She said, I, I, she was probably worried. She didn't tell me. But you see, he told me to leave. And so when we talked about coming back, they said, well, we'll come back on the 7th of October. And I said, oh, no, 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 we can't come back on the 7th. 6, 7, 8, 9. I said, the operation's on 9. See, if we'd come back the 7th, we'd have been in turbulence. I don't know how we'd have jumped around. I don't know what all would have happened. But because we went the days he told me, we missed all the storms halfway around the world going and coming. And it was, it was almost as smooth to India and back, almost, as it was the last journey across to Israel on October, was it 15th? But you see, we missed all the storms on the earth, half, nearly halfway around the world, because Jesus is merciful. By his grace, could that ever be again? But he sent me when the person that lived there felt that that was not the time. See, a person that lives in certain areas know what's going to take place there. And he sent me when it looked as though it was a hard time, a difficult time, a rainy time. I've never been in India before. I didn't know what I was, we were going to encounter. But when the Holy Spirit told me to go, just trust. Oh, we had some experiences there. But the Lord helped us through all of them. And because Jesus led us uh, there at that time, his Holy Spirit just was so dear to all of us. The, the persons that were to go were with us. I wanted to take Janie, but the Lord told me, no, we couldn't. And this infection came in her body. See, it was not God's will for me to take James, son James, to Israel when he wanted to go. I said, Emery, I said, you write and tell him that he can't go with us. That was in the early 70s, as I remember. 72. So Emory had to write James and tell him, my son James, because we didn't know him then. All I knew was that she told me he had been faithful to send in tithes to the treasure, and he wanted to go to Israel. That's what she told me. And you said, may he go? And I, pray. I said, oh, Emory, you'll have to write and tell him he can't go. Now, how difficult was that for me to tell this son in the gospel to write and, and tell this son that I didn't know yet that he could not go to Israel with us? Because the Holy Spirit witnessed to me that he wasn't to go. That wasn't easy for me to tell him, right? It wasn't easy for him to tell James. But the day we left, 10 or 12 weeks later, we left. He was on the operating table. Then they knew why. Jesus had told me in advance. There's things that happened right here. Some of you knew. It's a marvel how God helped us. And yesterday, today. Because we do not know. We're only seeking to give Jesus all the praise and all the glory. For I am nothing. You can't... I'm so, I feel an awful little. I, if I was way down here, I guess I'd feel better. But I'm way up here, not because I'm worthy, but because I'm nothing. <laughs> I am little. But I want you to know that I just feel so unworthy of this place. You all know that, I'm sure. Most of you do. To be privileged to be guided of Jesus. To have Jesus, the Christ, the risen Lord, guided by the Holy Spirit. And he said to go to India at that time. And furthermore, he didn't only say go to India. He said go to Egypt. And that's one place I didn't want to go back to. 
And I was there in 1970. It was so dark, Oliver. Uh, Reverend Morgan, Thomas, Emery. I didn't think maybe I'd hear. I didn't know whether God would ever send me, but if it's my desire, I'd rather not have gone. You know, just a human in me. I'm weak. But I don't go for that. I must not go for that. The Lord said, go by the way of Cairo. And Tina said, I have tried the Sheraton, I've tried the Holiday Inn, I've tried the Hilton, I've tried all those in Cairo. They're all filled with people. There aren't any rooms. What are we going to do? Can we stop in uh, Tel Aviv on the way or Istanbul or some other place? I said, no, we can't stop anywhere but Cairo. She said, I've endeavored for days and days and I haven't been able to find a place. I said, well, just keep trying. She said, I will. And just a few days before we left, it wasn't long, she found a little hotel just big enough to hold all 40-some of us. He said, go to Egypt. He didn't say to stop at Israel. He sent me there 19 times. It wasn't God's will for me to stop there. Or Rome or any other place. It was God's will for me to go there. Now I'm talking about doing God's will. And this is, uh, this is all important. Doing God's will. It'll be by his mercy so I'll know his will again. See it's by his grace I will know. See, he must have all the praise and all the glory for everything at all times. Because if it isn't, then I don't know what his will is when it's revealed. Can you hear what I said? Now that, that's a mouthful. I think how serious it is. That's why he said it's so straight and narrow. That's why it's so narrow. You see, it's so narrow that if I have the slightest wrong attitude, I get to the left and I'm off the way. I can't discern his will. If I'm too zealous and I get some slight in the flesh and I'm too far to the right and I'm off of his will, I can't discern it. It must be by his Holy Spirit, as I am childlike. Before, because if I'm not childlike, I wouldn't know what his will is. Because only the little ones have the revelation. They that fear God. Father, I thank thee that thou hast withheld these things from the wise, the prudent, to learn, and you've revealed them unto babes. See, God's revelation is unto the little ones. It doesn't mean that someone that has studied and, and studied couldn't have the right. They can if there's a childlike spirit and they follow Jesus. Indeed. But his revelation, he said, is into the little ones. So there must be at all times the right spirit giving him all the praise in order to discern what God's will is. He said, leave a certain day in September. He said, to go to Cairo. Listen, we could have gone to other cities and to find hotels and had meetings. We'd have been as empty as a rain barrel at the end of the house where the eve comes down and hasn't rained for six months or a year. For longer. Longer than that, that'd be pretty dry, wouldn't it? Yes, we could go to the finest place. It wasn't God's will for us to go anyplace else. You see, the Lord knew the human in me had an experience in Cairo. And when I got there, Reverend Hill would tell you, he'd look at me and Oliver and Brother Morgan and Thomas. He says, I tell you, we're in a dark place. Oh, we were. We were in a dark place. Not because of the people there, but because of the powers of the air raging at that time. And all Bible scholars know that Egypt's a type of sin. Is that right? right. And it doesn't mean that the people there are sinners, yet we're all sinners, save the grace. We've all sinned, come short of the glory of God. So I'm not running down to people. I'm running up the thing of going with God and doing God's will. And see, I love everyone the same. So I love the Arabs just like I love the Jews. Well, there isn't any difference. You see, if there were, then I wouldn't know God's will. I would never be able to discern God's will. If I loved any one group, see, I love all my black brothers just like I love all you, my white brothers. All the same. Because if I didn't, I wouldn't know God's will. He couldn't trust me with it. I'm getting happy. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, you just love everybody the same. But just try to think it would be it wouldn't be possible for a man or woman to know God's will if we didn't love everyone the same it wouldn't be right it'd violate the law of love 
So all things without respect to persons would violate it. How we got into this on doing God's will. Been in this for about 20 some minutes. And here he said to go to Cairo, Egypt. And I want you to know when I got to Cairo, it was wonderful. Oh, I had a great time. I did. Oh, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Still enjoying it. Because it was God's will that I go there. We had to labor to find a place, but it was found. What God usually wills is one of the most difficult. It's hidden. It's hidden. God's will is hidden. You can't understand it. It's by death. It's by not these eyes, but the spiritual eyes of the soul. God's will, most people never get to it because they give up. They don't die enough, pray enough, obey till they never get to God's will. Because they have their own will to battle with, and so they just hit and miss. Here I am preaching. I'd rather talk about the kingdom, the deep when I'm hungry. And if you spend a few days with me, you'll find out in just the first section. Time. Oh, see, I'm having a great time right here. Try endeavoring to tell you a little bit, a small, tiny measure of a slight part of the alpha, the beginning of doing God's will. And here I was having a great time in Egypt. <laughs> Well, I enjoyed the prayer meetings, but what I enjoyed more was just being where God told me to be. See, I enjoy being where the Lord leads me. I enjoy it. The Lord helps me. I wish I could tell you about it. I wish I could. I, I'm trying. <laughs> Endeavoring. See, when God leads, that's, that is a little bit of heaven. But there's a constant dying all the while to follow, to wait. You see, to have uh, the human, this nature cleansed so that Jesus, our blessed Jesus, can be first. Not my wife or my children, my loved one, but Jesus. And then he gives me the capability of loving my wife, my children, my enemies, my loved ones all more. And we had two busloads of people in Egypt, and I had requested, this is review, talking about doing God's will, I had made a request. Once in a while, the Lord will grant it. And, and you'll th I think you'll think it's pretty good. The request was, may we be privileged to eat on the banks of the River Nile. You see, because Moses was just picked up just down the branch there a little ways from us. And I wanted to get as close as I could. You know, if it was all right. You know, just be on the River Nile. And so Tina and the travel people there found a restaurant right near the banks of the River Nile. My request was granted. Oh, I did something in my life then. I did something. Just click. Did you get that? I'm glad. Praise the Lord. Isn't that great? Praise the Lord. I think I better walk a while. <laughs> Woo! Glory to God. <laughs> wonderful. I tell you, I don't know. Just think how wonderful it was that I could uh, praise the Lord and have a time. Wait just a minute here. I'll give you a little loving. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. You're off the truth. Well, I love you too. Very much. You know that. Thank you. Yes, I know that. Thank you, Lord. So glad to see you. Mm, glad to see you. Yes, yeah, good of you eyes you have. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been making over now for about 53 years. Man loves his wife as he loves his own body, or more. Praise the Lord. So the Holy Spirit. Oh, so precious, you grant us that request. And uh, we, two busloads of people, made our way to this little restaurant. And you know, it was kind of a, the tables, there's a beautiful canopy, you know. And the tables were about as long as this platform and had white cloth. 
I think they had four or five tables. And uh, my table was the farthest one to the south. So we walked to the tables. I had my request. And when I arrived, the table was mostly covered by ants. The little ants about that long. I walked up and I acted, I said to all the ones I whispered, I said, don't pay any attention to the ants. Don't, just brush them off. Don't, don't let any of the rest of the people know they're even on the table. Just, just, get, just get your hands going and we'll get them all off of the cloth. And so all around, do you remember this? Yes, sir. And I said, we'll get them off. Don't let anybody hear it. Embarrass them. They're sorry that one ant's on there instead of thou, a thousand or I, I don't know how many thousands on there. Lots and lots and lots and lots. <laughs> But I said, don't pay any attention to the lots of ants, just brush them off. And so we all just brushed and brushed and picked up the plates and brushed everything off. The wonder was this, but when we were through brushing all the ants off that white cloth, I never saw another ant. The entire meal. They didn't any of them crawl back. They said, we're not welcome. <laughs> so they just kept, you see, they was trying to see if I was going to be disappointed. So they didn't come back. Now, it's a wonder the ants didn't crawl back, but they didn't. You see, he granted me the request. Now, you ask a request, and there may be something there that will make it hard on you. But don't pay attention to it. Just go ahead and wipe it away. And rejoice as if they're not there. Because it takes God to help us to do this. We can't do this in our own nature. And not one ant appeared. I have marveled at this ever since. Now, I didn't see one ant at this part of the cloth or coming up the leg. I didn't feel one on my, on my stocking. I didn't even feel an ant crawling on me. I have had little mice run up when I go to the barn. They'd run up my... You know, it's an awful feeling to have a mouse run up your leg right there. <laughs> you just get it down and say you don't need to come any farther. <laughs> so the ants didn't come back. We've got to know how to deal with the things we're in. Uh, with a, not with a carnal way, but with a spiritual love for God and for all that he's shared with us. So here we were, eating on the river bank of the Nile. Yeah, beautiful scene. Beautiful scene. We'd look, we'd look to the west and there were the pyramids. Oh, they were beautiful. We'd been there before, I had. If you of you had been with us. But the most important part of our trip to Egypt was the young man that was the guide on the other bus that I did not know. See, I didn't know him. I hadn't talked to him at all. And one of the men came to me at the table and said, this beautiful young man, the guide on the other bus, wants to talk to you. So I got up from the table. I went uh, to the east, where he was standing at the end of the table a ways. And I talked to him, and he said, I, I thought perhaps you might have a little prayer with me. I said, I'd be delighted to try. So I started praying with him, and I hadn't prayed but a few words, so it dawned in my mind. And I said, my dear brother, just repeat after me, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. And he said, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I said, Lord Jesus, apply your precious blood to my heart. He said, Lord Jesus, apply your precious blood to my heart. Lord Jesus, I accept thee as my personal Savior by faith. And he was converted right there, right there by the table over there. And he said to Tina, he said, who knows but what you came to Egypt just for me. She said it rather got to her. See, we were there for him. Oh, it was a handsome young man. We could have, if it had been God's will, he could have come home. He spoke such fluent English. And you would have enjoyed him. His spirit was very kind. You see, it was worth more than gold and silver to find him in Egypt. I think that's, uh, that was the reason we were there. That was the reason. We stopped to see one soul saved in Cairo, Egypt. Well, we're talking about doing God's will. We were lifted up out of there on our way and landed in Kuwait, where if I've ever seen so many gas wells burning of a night, I think it could have been about the most I've ever seen. Would you think so? Yes. 
we had a little experience at Kuwait. And then we lifted up on that 747 and started to the east toward Nadili and arrived there. Uh, I'd look out the plane, the window. If you're with me flying, uh, people would think I never flew much. Across, by God's grace, across the Atlantic Ocean 50 times. And I don't know how many times the United States. I never wanted to fly, so I didn't fly until I was 52 years of age. And the first plane that I got on, the Lord told me the night before we were going to have trouble on the plane. And I forgot it from 2 o'clock that morning until I sat down about 9 or 10 that day. And son Kenneth was with me. And I turned and I said, Kenneth, and he was so excited about me flying. Oh, he was so, he always said, Dad, I'm so glad I'm going to get to be with you on the first flight. He said, you know, I love flying so much, I like to jump in parachutes. <laughs> the plane was full, 747, one of the long ones. And I just sat down, and just as my body touched the chair, he spoke to me. He said, there's something wrong in this plane. So I said, son, there's something wrong with this plane. <laughs> He said, there is. He said, I feel that in my heart. I said, I didn't know it. But God tried to, told me last night at 2 o'clock we're going to have trouble, but I forgot it until my body hit the chair. And then he spoke and he showed me in my heart. He said, well, I, I can tell it in my heart. And I said, well, just pray. Just trust. So we buckled up and I started. I never wanted to fly. I'll wait. Several years ago, it say to me, it's like silk up there. Just climb in with me and I'll take you for a ride. I said, no, thank you. I never wanted to fly in a plane because I was afraid of getting up in the air. I fell out of a tree one time. And on, well, it didn't kill me, but it was awful bad, bad. So it frightened me, height. But here we are going down the runway, O'Hare Field, Chicago, about 110, 20, 30, 130, when the big engine exploded. Oh, my, my. Exploded twice with such awful, awful power. And of course they put the brakes on, the other two engines they put in reverse, and we just stopped in time. Just a few days before, after that, Kenneth told me in Oregon, he said, that, Dad, I just read that in England, uh, since we came, 727, had the same thing happen to it, only they got about 500 feet when that engine exploded and they just fell and they all were killed. So I told him, as we sit at the end of the runway, there wasn't any talking. Some man came through with some instruments and things. And he said, well, this plane's not going anyplace. And we knew that. <laughs> it, was, it was through for a while. We're going to have to recondition the engine, redo it. And then when we got on the next plane, see, I, wanted to, I didn't want to fly. I wanted to go a train. And this plane has something wrong with it, and we, and the Lord had so many angels there to get it exploded before we got off the, off the ground, and He's merciful to us. And then in three hours we're on another plane, and we get up, we get away up. Oh, He says, Dad, it's going to be great now. We're coming up above the clouds, and I saw the sun above the clouds the first time. He says, It's going to be great. I said, Oh, I said, Oh, son, there's something wrong with this one too. <laughs> he said, What? I said, There's something wrong with this plane. So I said, well, just rest. <laughs> no, I tell you, it takes God to help me. And we flew about uh, 12, 1,500 miles and was landing. We were going to land in Portland, Oregon. I'll tell you, they had the, they had the fire trucks and they had the ambulances. Because the landing gears wouldn't go down. And so we had to come back up. And we took quite a ride. And I said, oh, God, get in this place. Get in this engine here, in the mechanism. Oh, help us, help us, help us. Send the power, send the power, send the power. Send the power. We need it now. Oh, God, we need it now. And they went down and we landed. Glory. And by God's grace, could this be again? But the Lord, as we lifted out of Kuwait, and we looked out... And I saw all that water. There was water, 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 water. For how many hundred miles do you suppose we went over water? They see the, the, the buildings were covered with water up to the eaves or over. Just 
on and on and on and on. I said, well, Jesus, if the, if the place where I'm going is like this, it's going to be, well, the only way you'd get there was a boat. But you know, we ran out of the water in several hundred miles, 200 miles. We ran out of the water, and when we got to Delhi, it was all right. It was fine. Everywhere he sent us was fine. Oh, there was a little mud here and there, but not anything to speak of. We got along because the Lord had told us to go to India on that day. I'm talking about doing God's will. Not because we decided to go, because someone asked us to go, but because the Lord was merciful to witness and then protect us. And we want to thank him and praise him for every bit of it. All to him I owe. Everything to Jesus, to God, the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Jesus. So they were planning for us to go to this place to dedicate the orphanage. And they had made plans to go a certain day. And I was praying and I said, Jaya, the Holy Spirit has revealed to me that we're not to go that day. She looked at me. I said, we cannot go that day. We must go the day before. So they had changed all their plans. Now, when you're in a foreign land, it takes a while sometimes to change things. And their concept of time sometimes is different than ours. Because sometimes they'd say, we're ready to go, and our people would get on the bus. Because they had taught us all to get on the bus. When they say get on the bus, be there. Two to five minutes ahead of time. So they'd sit there, and 15 minutes, they said, we'll go in a little while. 30 minutes, well, we'll get ready after a bit. Is this right? Um, would you sit there an hour? And you just wait. You wait until uh, they get ready. Maybe the bus driver needs to go in and take a nap or go in somewhere. <laughs> Is that right? That's right. Uh, see, I'm not just talking uh, because I try never to say anything, only the exact truth. No more, no less. Just giving you a little idea that our concepts are different about things. And we have to just trust and rejoice when it's difficult. Like when we got into one hotel. It was dark. My wife shook all over. She just shook like that. And she cried. And she cried. And I got her in my arms. And I just prayed. And I said, oh, Jesus, help her. Help her, Lord. Encourage her. She was like she was scared. She just, I never in her life. And she just cried. And she cried. And I held her. Just held her tight. Just held her as And I said, you're all right, honey. See, what she had was a burden of all those things around there. And we were supposed to have a nice suite, but we were down in a dark place. And she was frightened. Never had had such an experience in her life that I ever knew of. It's true. But you see, I just held her and prayed and rejoiced. And she, after about 5, 10, 15 minutes, Jesus just came and gave her rest. Took the burden away. Now, sometimes when you're in God's will, you'll have some tests and trials. and There'll be some crying and there'll be some... <laughs> things going on, but just hold, stay, just hold tight and rejoice best you can. Oh, it's hard sometimes. It's difficult sometimes. That's the hotel, I think, where the, where the goats were in the hallway. <laughs> huh? All night. All night. Part of the night. The goats were in there. I think that's the place where they took up some food and Thomas Harmon found a, what was it, Thomas? I thought it was a cockroach. Is that right? How many knew about that? Well, we just rejoiced. We rejoiced. I'm talking about doing God's will. Now, there's a little hard place this time, but you don't go by that. You go by rejoicing. Yeah. I was, they served me down here at Cincinnati, a very wonderful restaurant. I looked, and there was a cockroach just swimming all around that beautiful iced tea. Just I said, uh, I just said, I'd like to have another glass if I may, if it's okay. And they said, oh, my, my, sure will. <laughs> I didn't complain. I just said it'd be nice to have a, you don't complain. You just show them the cockroach, and that's all you have to do. <laughs> yeah. It's like when I was eating a wonderful salad one time. I was eating a wonderful salad. And then I picked up a roll of hair, like my mother used to have about that big around. It was all big roll of hair, and it was that way this way. Do you remember that, Robert? Roger, Virginia, 
So I just lifted it up. You know, when the waitress came, I didn't have to say anything. To show her that. She said, here, you can have anything in the house. <laughs> I thought I tasted some hair, but I got that out of there. And it wasn't too bad. <laughs> because the Lord helped me so it wasn't too bad. So he helps you with hard things sometimes. But we were to be at a certain orphanage at a certain day, and the Lord revealed to me not to go that day. So I said we go the day before. They had to change their plans. And they got them changed. It took us a long while to get there. It took us two to three hours to get there. Now, when you're in India, you know, I thought they blew horns in Egypt in 1970. I thought they blew horns. Well, they did. But I hadn't been to India yet. Did they blow horns there? Yes, sir. Some or a lot? It seemed to me like in the hotel that it was hardly a few seconds before what I'd hear a horn blowing. Now, is that the way you found it? But you see, we didn't go by the horn blowing. We went to rest uh, and do God's will there to dedicate an orphanage and to name a little baby that had just been born a few days. And I was to take that baby and give it its name and dedicate that baby to God and Christ. And here we are driving all these miles and miles to this place. And you know, um, I can't explain to you how it is, but in India, it seems like several drive in the middle of the road. Do you think it's a few James or more? Yeah. It seems like that you get on the highway and they're right, uh, James is right. Remember that time you're going down, you say, oh, we missed that time. You remember that? <laughs> He threw up his hands and said, oh, we missed again. I was yeah. sitting up front, front seat, and the, the little narrow road, and we were coming down through there, and I failed about all the tests. We were coming down through there, and, and I'm used to, when you come to a oncoming traffic, you veer to the right. Oh, it's all well, they drive the way they do in England. Yeah. And when that bus driver veered to the left, I came up out of my seat. <laughs> I thought we was going to hit him head he took, on. He took care of us. He made a way for us. Just remarkable, really. And, and see, I didn't know about driving like that. And there'd be times, Richard will tell you, that I just, oh, my driver, I just cried to God for help in my heart. Well, when we arrived near the orphanage, thank you, when we arrived near the orphanage, we couldn't get there because there was too much mud. So the local medical doctor brought his tractor and trailer, farm trailer, and took us as many as he could, you know, as far as he could go, and then we walked the rest away in the mud. We walked the rest away in the mud.